Welcome to an alternate Hugh. I'm Hugh Anderson, and this is some of what caught my attention this week. So the Roaring Twenties, huh? The original Roaring Twenties was born on the back of the demographic cohort entering their 30s, according to demographer Neil Howe. If we assume the current decade of the 20s will be powered by our millennials, then here's what Howe forecasts. It ain't gonna happen. Unlike the prior two generations, Gen X especially, America was determined to shower these babies on board with attention, structure, and protection. His prior predictions for this group have come to pass. Warning, this is not a critique of the millennials, it's just how powerful demographics are in driving an economy. So millennials will become closer, not more alienated from their parents. Surveys confirm that young boomers in their 20s hardly spoke to their parents. Millennials, by contrast, often talk or text to their parents several times a week. The share of young people in their 20s and early 30s living with their parents has steadily risen, even during the recent economic expansion, and, and is now at an historical high going back over a century. Millennials would take fewer, not more, risks in their personal lives. They smoke less, they drink less, they don't fight in school, they wear their seatbelts, and the list goes on. You name it, these risks have all been lower for millennials, sometimes dramatically lower than for Xers and boomers at the same age. I can attest to that. Millennials would gravitate toward more, not less, conformity and convention in the culture. Remember the counterculture in the 60s? Our millennials are having none of that. Millennials want more, not less, from communities and government. They also want to put the adjective social in front of just about everything, from social media to social investing. Where young boomers and Xers often fled surveillance by the community, millennials embrace it, their most dreaded fear being loneliness, according to Howe. As for politics, millennials broadly favor big government by nearly a two to one margin. That's the most lopsided advantage among young voters since the New Deal in the 1930s. Now, if there's one rule of generations, it's this. No youth generation wants to reenact what the last youth generation did. If young boomers knew anything, it's that they would not be the goody two shoes like the silent generation and young Xers, God forbid, did not want to become yuppies. And millennials? According to how none of them will end up hogging all the money at the end of X Games and Survivor. This litany is not a criticism of our millennial generations, it's just a fact. That's why booming decades of freewheeling wildness in American history do not frequently recur. Those who grew up in their wake have no desire to repeat the experience anytime soon. It took bell bottoms and polyester a long time before making a comeback, and thankfully it was short lived. Then we have a few other critical differences between the 2020s and the last century's 20s. Societal debt for one. From individuals to corporations to governments and anything else you can think of, we owe our soul to the general store. And taxes are going up, not down. More on that in a moment. And as a nation, our population is quite a bit older on average than 100 years ago. We're going through a major technological evolution displacing substantial number of workers as well. And educational quality and levels are not keeping up with these changes. So strap in for a wild decade, but it might not be in the form many expect. So let's talk taxes. Will Denyer of GovCal Research, one of our research partners, says three major elements of the president's plan are now clear. He announced plans to raise the U.S. corporate income tax rate. Originally, it was set to go up to about 28% from 21, but now it looks like it might settle around 25% to keep uh, Senator Joe Manchin happy. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is asking the G20 countries to agree to a global minimum corporate tax rate to cooperate on taxing large multinational corporations in order to put an end to tax arbitrage. That's basically where a company parks its operations in a lower tax country and keeps its profits there, never sending them home. And President Biden is proposing a hike to the headline tax rate of capital gains for rich Americans from 20 to 39.6 percent. Add on the uh, Obamacare surcharge, and you've got a 43.4% tax rate on the highest marginal income tax brackets. And he's also talking about raising the estate taxes. Now, the good news is all affected parties have now withdrawn to consider the implications of these proposals, and thoughtful and constructive feedback is expected shortly. Stay tuned for that. So our world has gone through an incredibly challenging and difficult times. Study have shown that those who are able to embrace change and harness resiliency will be the ones to not only survive, but continue to thrive, no matter what the challenges might be ahead. High Tower Las Vegas is happy to share Raising Resilient Children and Young Adults. This seminar will outline the key components necessary to teach and build resiliency in children and young adults, thereby laying a foundation of success for their families. 
This video is focused on how to adapt goals and plans, especially for student athletes or those following a tight course when options change, how to think big picture when the world around you seems to be shrinking, and how to verbalize what you're going through to grow. If you would like a link to the video for yourself or a loved one, just send an email to me, handerson at hightoweradvisors.com, and we'll get it to you ASAP. But, 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 I thought we were going on vacation. Funny. With the reopening of the economy in full bloom, one has to wonder why the airline sector isn't exhibiting the same enthusiasm. But I hope you're sitting down for the next one. Because, well, it's been a very long time to see an uptick in this metric. There's another bull market going on, and it's not in the stock market. How about congressional approval ratings? And also, the percentage of folks saying the country's on the wrong track is also at its lowest level since June 2009. Could it possibly have anything to do with the bread and circuses handouts we, the people, have been enjoying? We'll see. Enjoy, but, but there's always a but. According to Dave Rosenberg of Rosenberg Research, we have 9.7 million Americans who are officially unemployed, another 6.9 million who are not counted in the labor force, but, a job, but would take a job if they could get one. And also, they have, we have 5.8 million people working part-time but actually want a full-time job. This comes to a total pool of available labor of 22 million people compared to 15 million people before the pandemic strike struck. That's not really good for them. In these videos, I hope to be clear and concise in the concepts I discussed, despite the fact I butchered the Queen's English during most of them. But it irks me to no end when I read or hear something that's not, especially well when one might expect obfuscation might just be intentional. In 2019, a report by the presidents of the National Academies of Sciences claimed the magnitude and frequency of certain extreme events are increasing. Clear enough. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is deemed to compile the best science, says all such claims should be treated with, quote, low confidence, unquote. Hmm. That's interesting. Why should we take such statements with the proverbial grain of salt? Well, here's an example. In 2017, the U.S. government's climate science special report claimed that in the lower 48 states, the number of high temperature records set in the past two decades far exceeds the number of low temperature records. Sounds really scary. On closer inspection, that's because there's been no increase in the rate of new record highs since 1900, only a decline in the number of new lows. Obfuscation at its finest. And finally, many of us keep asking, how can the stock market keep going up? More buyers than sellers, says the old Wall Street cliche. And in fact, inflows to global equity funds for the last five months exceed the prior 12 years. Digest that. That's some pretty good punch they've been drinking from the speculative trough. That's it for this week. I'm Hugh Anderson. I hope you found this time well spent. Until next time, I wish you much health, happiness, and prosperity.